so it's the outer muscle wall, right? So it's the, there's the intussusceptum and the intussusceptum or something like that. So um, this would be the one that is accepting the, you know, inner layer of uh, abdominal viscera. Um, what's this right here? Yeah, it's a little bit fluid trapped in there. And this stuff right here, it's the, sorry? Ilium. The ileum, yeah. So there's, so it's probably some combination of ileum slash um, the uh, abdominal visceral, kind of like the uh, the fat, because it's got that echogenic appearance to it. So it's probably pulling in some of that fat that's surrounding the abdominal viscera. And uh, what's this right here? What do you think that is? I have a guess. I don't know if I'm entirely correct. It may or may not be what I think it is, but no, I mean, it could be. That's not a bad thought. It's kind of got a similar appearance to like some kind of, you know. They're inside, don't they? Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's the inside of the intestine? Um, it may not be the inside of the intestine. It may actually be a lymph node. Um, I'm wondering if it's a lymph node, just because if you see it play through, we've seen it play through before, it kind of has this appearance of that kind of nodular structure. Now, that may not be what it is. I, I'm not entirely certain because we don't have flow on that thing. And, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things where knowing and, and, and seeing is really that important. There's a bunch of different potential lead points. So classic lead points like a Meckel's diverticulum, lymph nodes, tumors, polyps, those sorts of things. We've had some where we've seen recently, um, I think Magli had an image with an appendix that was pulled in. I don't know if it was a lead point or just sort of a bystander in the whole operation, but um, there's a ton of different potential lead points. I would say that it's Nice to know. It doesn't really change very much for you as a POCUS provider to know what the lead point is in a big way. Um, I, Mark can argue differently. I, I feel like it's nice to know, but like, you know, it's it's one of those things which, and there may be some evidence that certain lead points are going to recur more often than others, um, but it, it doesn't change much about what you're going to do in the moment, which is the fact that you're diagnosing a deception and you need them to, you know, get definitive care. Um, but nonetheless, it's important to know that uh, you can obviously have lead points. Another one that's kind of nice to look at, but probably not very practically important, is looking at uh, sort of flow uh, around an interception. Um, there is some evidence out there that would suggest that those who have decreased flow of the internal structure and consequently have, you know, uh, potential ischemia are at higher risk for um, both perforation during the reduction procedure as well as failure of the reduction. Um, I don't think we're ever going to you know, unless we get a lot better with our skills and, and, and know kind of what we're looking for, going to look for this in a big way. I don't usually put flow on um, because for the most part, even if you didn't see flow, I don't think our convention right now is to not do a reduction. I think you're still going to attempt a reduction regardless. Like there's, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but where some of that uh, kind of um, research is. Measurement wise, um, sometimes people get a bit confused by all these structures, but typically your interception is going to come right to the surface, right? So um, that's usually where you're going to start your measurement, right outside that first slightly hypoechoic layer, and then down somewhere at the back, which can sometimes be a bit hard to see. So it's okay to also measure from the transverse. But basically, you're looking for something it, typically in a neocolic that's going to be about 2.5 to 3 centimeters. Now, if you have a younger infant, um, that can sometimes be less than that. Um, but these are kind of good ballpark numbers to remember, um, which isn't to say that if you see something that's 2.2 centimeters, that you should be like, oh, that's fine. Um, it's just more a matter of what you're typically going to see as compared to things like small bowel interceptions, which we can look at in just a few minutes. Um, so how good are we? Um, it seems like we're pretty actually pretty darn good. Um, the, there's been two major papers that came out in 2014 and 2012 looking at um, large uh, numbers of, of patients. Uh, and LAM in 2014 actually found that uh, people were or, or POCUS providers. So these are people who had very little actual training in ultrasonography. So one hour of, of training looking for interception. So that's probably as much as you guys are getting just from this lecture, right? Um, they were 100% sensitive and had almost 100% specificity. Um, and one of the times where they missed uh, a case was during a transient interception. 
Um, and then another one where they thought they saw an its inception um, was actually not a true one. It was something else, but um, they didn't miss, uh, sorry, they didn't miss any inceptions. They only saw things that were there and then disappeared or saw things um, that they thought were interceptions, but turned out not to be. So, so there was no false negatives within this group. Um, the other study was a little less in terms of the sensitivity and specificity, but still very good. I mean, if you took any test and you said, oh, you have an 85% you know, sensitivity and specificity, um, and this was 97% specificity, you'd be pretty happy with that test. So, so it's a very, very good test in general. Um, and it certainly seems like from a rule in standpoint, you can feel pretty confident. Um, a rule out where obviously we like to set our bar nice and high because we, you know, the convention would be something that's basically 100% sensitivity, which is a abdominal ultrasound done by a, you know, a technician. Um, so, so we, we are probably pretty close to there and you wonder about anyone who has, you know, a significant amount of training, what exactly those numbers would look like. Um, I suspect you're, you're, you're approaching basically the same numbers that, uh, radiologists uh, have in their literature. So what's the next level? Well, um, the next level is trying to prove, well, so what? So we can do this really well. Uh, what does, uh, what does this actually mean for our practice and how should we change our practice? And, you know, is this just us wasting our time when we're going to send these kids for ultrasound anyways? Well, I would contend that there's a very good paper that recently came out that actually proves why we should be doing this um, in a nice, meaningful way. So um, this was a study out of Korea. These guys looked at a few different interception related factors. They did another paper that looked at uh, correlative factors with um, failed reductions and uh, return visits. Um, but this paper I thought was really pretty interesting. So as a group, they had basically, like many people, been conventionally doing um, radiologist-driven ultrasounds for their patients up until about 2014 when they did sort of an in-servicing and, and really upped the skills of their providers at doing point-of-care ultrasounds. So they talked about a pre-period prior to 2014 and a post-period there afterwards. Um, and they, they basically developed this new algorithm where in many cases they actually discharged patients who had a negative ultrasound. Now, you could look at the research I just looked at before and say... Maybe that's not the workflow you should have when you're doing it, but nonetheless, that's what they did. They discharged people a lot more often um, when they uh, started doing it at the bedside. Um, and if their ultrasound was positive or they still had a high clinical suspicion of an interception, they would still go on to a routine ultrasound. So none of these patients who had an interception did not get a, a routine ultrasound done by a radiologist. Um, it's just that in some cases when they wouldn't see an interception, they would actually just not do a, an ultrasound follow-up um, because they were pretty confident in their in their skills. And, and the big take home of what they had here is that they reduced their ED length of stay by a significant amount. Now, the one big caveat to that is that probably the biggest majority of the time they reduced off of it is at the bottom here on their observation time. So that has nothing to do with the ultrasounds. That has everything to do with how long do you consider observation for interception now. Um, but still in, in the other areas that we would probably contend are the uh, ultrasound or POCUS beneficial time. So the door to reduction time, they reduced it by about a half hour. Um, you could argue about, you know, if you, existed in a future state where you didn't need to do an ultrasound um, image by a radiologist, wouldn't that reduce it that much more? Um, but nonetheless, uh, either way, they, they definitely reduced a lot of their length of stay times uh, in relation to it. The other thing that I think from a system standpoint was really, really cool, <clears throat> they have this chart here which talks about, uh, which shows a few different things. It's a bit confusing to look at initially, um, but very notable that they had many fewer negative ultrasounds in the post period. So when they were actually sending kids for ultrasound to radiology, they actually developed a, a much higher rate of positive ultrasound. So many, many less times that they sent someone to ultrasound, they just came back saying, oh, there's no interception there. So their rate of positive ultrasounds went from 33% during the pre-period to 59% in the post-period. So they basically doubled their yield of tests that inevitably went to radiology. Um, so what this does suggest too, is that they had many patients that they were just not sending to radiology now that they used to be sending. Um, and, and if you, they didn't actually report this in their paper, but if you actually look at what their numbers were based on this chart, 
Um, in the pre-period, they had 203 ultrasounds that they ordered and only 67 which were positive. And in the post-period, it was 181 ultrasounds that were ordered and 93 that were positive. So they definitely ordered less ultrasounds and add, and when they did order them, they were much more likely to be positive because of course they were, they knew in advance that they were positive. So um, I thought that this was really, really cool because they, they actually proved the, the inherent benefits of doing these at the bedside, which is that we're clinically using our resources in a lot more judicious way. So we may not actually change the workflow of our hospital, but, but we're definitely going to be um, utilizing the resources in a bigger way. And then the big thing people will say, well, because they were discharging all these patients, what about uh, all those return visits they must have had because of all the missed interceptions? Well, they had nothing.